Hello, everybody. I'm Jingjing. Today, I want to talk about Xinjiang. I've been to Xinjiang several times myself and talked to people from different ethnicities. Xinjiang is such a beautiful place with very diverse cultures and very diverse people. Because besides Uyghurs and Han, people from 47 ethnicities live in that region. But this beautiful region has a very painful history because it was plagued by terrorist attacks that got so many innocent people from all ethnicities killed. But today, I'm not going to talk about my journey there. I would like to share with you the journey from an Australian British who had traveled to Xinjiang more than me. He bicycled his way not just across Xinjiang but also across China, and his experience and observations as tourists in Xinjiang might be very different from the not so pleasant stories that you've heard of. A lot of people believe foreigners are not allowed to go to Xinjiang. So, as a foreigner yourself, how did you get there? I've, I've been there five times.、Uh, I haven't just been twice. I've been five times since 2005.、Um, each time I've been there has been a different way. I've、um, I, the first time I went on a slow train, the old green train, and there was no problems. That was 2005, and I think that was before people realized that there were issues with Xinjiang and the Uyghurs and the things that were that are alleged by the mainstream media. Uh, the most recent was we flew in there. We just bought a ticket from Guangzhou Airport to Urumqi. It's a five-hour flight, and we flew in there. And when we got off the plane, we walked through.、Uh, th- there was there was security coming off the plane. That's unusual. And we walked through there, picked up our baggage, walked out, got into a taxi, went to our hotel, which we pre-booked.、Uh, we walked into the hotel, and again there was security there. So, having just come through a metal detector in the airport, we went into the hotel through a metal detector there, and then we checked into the hotel. There was no problems with that. They were expecting us. We booked tickets,、uh, booked rooms. It's no more difficult than me flying to Beijing. No more difficult than flying to Shanghai. I've been to many, many cities by plane and by train, and、uh, I've, I've experienced nothing more in Xinjiang in terms of the administration of getting there. Once you're there, there's more security, but there's no no restriction, no visa, no permit, no travel block or ban. So when you were in Xinjiang, what what did you see there?、Uh, all of these things are quite apparent when you're living there or staying there. Uh, you can hear the call to prayer four or five times a day. You can see people going in and out of the mosques. The, this story that the the,、um, the the practice of Islam is being wiped out is is totally untrue. Now, if that story is untrue, what other stories are untrue?、Um, the story about the language being wiped out is totally untrue because you can see the language everywhere, and and that's the point that I've been making on Twitter. And probably the point that has caused me most of the problems that I have on Twitter, where people don't believe me, and my question to them is, well, when were you last there? And they haven't been, and I have, and so they'd rather believe a story that they see on CNN or BBC. They'd rather believe that than a guy who they think is making up the story. It's it's really gone a little bit crazy that that、uh, many of them start saying things to me like, "But you can't ride in Xinjiang," and my answer to that was, "Well, yes, you can."、Uh, what restrictions did you find there? Well, apart from heavy security, no restrictions. Of course, we were. You could say we were restricted. We had to go in and out of every town through a security check. We check into every hotel with video recognition, facial recognition, and swiping ID cards、uh, for my wife, who's Chinese. And and our passports are almost destroyed by the number of times it's been checked by different people.、Uh, so yeah, we we were very very heavily scrutinized. But at no stage did anyone say you can't go there or you can't take pictures of this. And that, to me, was the start of、uh, when I realized that I had these pictures of Xinjiang that no one ever tried to stop me taking. No one told me we can't go down this road. No one told me that we can't stay here. But at no stage did they say, "Show us your fi- show us your photographs, show us your camera. Let's see what you've got on there. Delete these pictures." Not a single time. And when I tell people that, they say, "Well, that's not true. You're a liar." But no, I'm not. That's a fact. Another thing that people keep saying is like how horrible the Chinese or Chinese government 
is treating the Muslim minorities, uh, like mm. like Mike Pompeo keeps saying, like a China Chinese government is like suppressing Uyghurs and other uh, Muslim minorities, and they are like yeah. kind of defending the Muslim minorities, even though they have a horrible history treating Muslims around the world, but they keep like, accusing Chinese government for this. So I wonder what, what? you saw when you like in Xinjiang, how okay. are the li no, like everyday lives of those Muslims, of those Uyghurs in Xinjiang? Okay, it's not just in Xinjiang because there are probably more Muslims in Gansu and Ningxia than in Xinjiang, but they're Hui Muslims and the Hui Muslims don't have a different, they have a different culture, but they don't have a different language. But um, I can tell you, every town, every village, every place we went through has a mosque or two or sometimes three or four mosques, depending on the size, even just traveling through a town which might only have 30 or 40 houses, there's a mosque. There are mosques everywhere. I read on Wikipedia, now I don't know if it's true because it's Wikipedia, but I read on Wikipedia that there are 25,000 mosques in Xinjiang and 39,000 imams, no, 29,000 imams. Now an imam is a kind of the high priest of the mosque or high priest of the, um, a priest of the, of the religion. Now, if there are 24 or 25,000 mosques, what are they there for? They're there for people to pray. One of the biggest tourist attractions in China is the Grand Mosque in uh, Xi'an. I've been there several times and I've no doubt almost every tourist to Xi'an has been there. There are thousands and thousands of Muslims go there four or five times a day and you can go in there as a tourist, you can uh, shop in the bazaar and the market outside. This is one of the biggest, I think it might be the biggest mosque in Asia. There's another interesting thing in uh, Turpan, which is the largest adobe. It means it's made with mud, minaret. It's a huge uh, tower, very, very tall tower made with mud. And it's a huge tourist attraction. Now, if, if the Chinese government wanted to suppress Islam, they'd be knocking them down, not rebuilding them. When you walk around Xinjiang, any of the towns or cities, you see Uyghurs freely walking around, doing what they do, their normal day-to-day -day business. They don't appear to be very depressed. They don't appear to be very subjugated. They don't appear to have any difference in their way of life to the way the Han people do. We're all go through the same security. Foreigners, Chinese, Uyghurs, whatever race, nationality, ethnicity you are, you go through the same security in Xinjiang. Here's the thing I find funny about people on Twitter, just as long as your opinion don't fit their narratives, even though you're just telling your own truth what you see, they will call you propaganda machine, you are just a bot or something. So and they will get very rude. They will just be very rude on Twitter. I don't know, like people got a wee angry on Twitter. Yeah, and I don't understand why that is. I mean, if you don't want to believe me, don't believe me. Just don't argue with me about it. Don't call me a liar. Don't call me a, a propaganda tool. Don't call me a bot. Just don't believe me and go away. Get, why are you on my page? If you, if you want to argue with me about something, you can discuss it. I'm happy if they say, well, what about? The, the, the big thing is, but what about the concentration camps? And I say, well, I didn't see any. That's all I can say. I didn't see any. There's definitely prisons in Xinjiang. Show me, show me a region of any country that doesn't have a prison. I've been in hundreds of prisons in my life for, for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. I, I, I spent 10 years as a police officer and I spent 18 years in the security industry. I've been in a lot of prisons. I know what a prison looks like. I also know what a secure building, a secure school, a secure service station where you buy your fuel. I know what these things look like. It's very, very secure. I understand that, but they're not prisons. And, and schools with barbed wire fencing, they're not prisons. The kids can come and go. They, that's normal. And I think a lot of people who criticize this don't actually understand the culture of China. The culture of China is that many kids go to boarding school. You probably lived in a school when you were 15, 16 years old. That's what most kids do. And uh, you get these China watchers, the experts, who say, well, they're being indoctrinated at school. Well, in fact, they're not. They're not allowed to speak Uyghur, right? Because the same in Guangdong, 
they're not allowed to speak Cantonese in their school. They speak Mandarin when they're in school. When they're out of school in their families, they speak they speak Cantonese. So it's exactly the same. It's no different. The school is there to teach them the national language. And if they learn the national language, they have better opportunities. It's not a case of wiping out the, the Uyghur population or wiping out the Uyghur language or the Uyghur culture. It's a case of adding to that culture the skills they need in order to get out of the poverty. And that's one thing I have noticed, uh, and I'm very, very strong on this. If you take a look at what's happened in Xinjiang over the last 15, 18, maybe longer years, uh, there's a lot of terrorism gone on there. There's a lot of bad things have happened. We know for a fact that there is a terrorist movement called the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, ETIM. And it wasn't China that said they were a terrorist movement. It was America. America made them a terrorist movement. America has locked them up in Guantanamo Bay and tortured them and done all of those nasty things to the Uyghurs. Now they're saying it's China's fault. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. If there is an international terrorist organization that consists mainly of Uyghurs inside of Xinjiang, then the government has every right to take action. Now what action they take, that's debatable, whether it's right, whether it's wrong. I'm not the guy to answer that question. Uh, you need your human rights people who are experts on this to go and have a look. You need counter-terrorism people who are experts on this to go and have a look. And that's something that did happen. Uh, a Russian guy for the United Nations, Vladimir Voronkov, is a, a, a counter-terrorism expert. He's the head of the United Nations counter-terrorism department. He went and had a look and he wrote a favorable report. The World Bank went and had a look and wrote a favorable report. Now, if those people are going and writing favorable reports, why can't the human rights groups go and have a look? Because they have been invited. So their reason for not going seems to be childish and pedantic in my mind. You have an opportunity to go, but you're saying if I go, it will legitimize your actions. Well, it, well it's, it's childish, it's pedantic, it's, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely absurd, that's right. If you have an opportunity to go and check the welfare of these people and don't, what is your hidden agenda? Why are you doing this? You worked as a policeman in the UK for, for 10 years, right? How do you see, with your background, with your knowledge, how do you feel about the security checks and this uh, China's measures of, to, to, to fight terrorism? Okay, I, I can answer that in just one line. When I was a police officer in London, if we had had that, I would have been happy. We never had that. The, the freedoms and the rights of people come higher than the uh, security issues. We never had the ability to stop people, search people, get them through. We didn't have metal detectors and cameras in those days, or not so many anyway. Uh, and so we never had the technology that China has. But I, I honestly, I wish we had. I wouldn't have seen some of the things that I saw. And that's a fact. If, if we had had that level of security, then there would have been several less dead people. What kind of uh, terrorist attacks that you saw when you worked as a policeman? I, I was actually involved in one in Hyde Park where a group of soldiers on horses who were going to do the, um, the horse guards parade change and they were bombed by the Irish Republican Army and uh, I was one of the first officers on scene. Uh, basically, it was carnage, it was awful. If the security measures can stop that, I'm in favor of the security measures. I'm not in favor of locking people up for no reason. There has to be a reason and there has to be justification. I think China has justification for its security. You're just sharing your observations, but you got attacked for speaking about what you saw, for speaking about what you believe in. So why did you decide to stand up and, and do this and kind of speak for China? Why do I stand up for China? It's not really that I stand up for China. It's I stand against people who are wrong about China because they don't know. 